So I've had a couple of requests from people about the Hyundai 1.6 CRDI engine. So we're going to address that in this video. I've asked a few people that I know that know these engines quite well, just for a few tips. Now, generally speaking, parts for these engines are quite hard to come by. So whereas I would like to review lots of parts and get a consensus on which parts are the best, we generally find that only one person has maybe tried a part, which isn't enough to build up a consensus. So please let me know in the comments what your experience has been, what model you found for this engine. The 1.6 CRDI is also known as the D4FB engine. It's been used in a number of Kia models. It's a really good sized engine. It provides a decent amount of power. There was a two litre variant. There were lower powered variants as well. So generally, we're going to focus on the 1.6 because that's the one I've been specifically asked for. But most of the points covered will expand onto those smaller and higher engine capacity models of this great little engine. And you can just get a feel for what upgrade options are out there for you and how you can get a little bit more power and enjoy your car that little bit more through this guide. So although a Korean manufacturer, a lot of European technology and a lot of European emissions regulations have gone into the design of this 1.6 CRDI engine. It was actually built in Slovakia and it has a bore and stroke of 77.2 millimeters by 84.5 millimeters a dual cam cylinder head and four valves per cylinder. There's actually a three cylinder 1.1 and a four cylinder two litre version of this engine and various other engine sizes in between. So generally for most cars, for most drivers that want a substantial amount of fun and performance as well as the economy, the 1.6 is generally the one people go for. The two litre obviously gives you more power, but it does take up that little bit more fuel. So a lot of people opt for this 1.6 litre engine. And it's a very, very fine engine. It provides a nice amount of torque and power. So researching this, I found three different power variants. There was an 89 horsepower, 113 horsepower and 126 horsepower version. And there are obviously a few differences between the bolt-on ancillary components used between those different power levels. But primarily it's down to the tuning within the ECU itself that makes a substantial amount of difference. And that's usually the place you need to go to to make more power from this engine. So it uses the Bosch CP1 fuel pump, which is a, a phenomenally reliable unit. It's brilliant in diesel engines. It gives you a nice regulated flow of fuel at the common rail for the injectors. It gives you a nice amount of control over the power delivery, the torque curve. And that's really where you go to when you want to tune these engines to get more power is unlocking the fuel system within the ECU. That's, that's really the primary aspect or focus of the tuner on these engines. So I know these were fitted in the Accent, the Kona, the Seltos, the Stonic or S-Tonic, the Elantra, the I-20, the I-30, the Tucson, and Kia models, the Seed, the Rio and the Sportage and I'm sure it's used in a few other models, please let me know in the comments what model you've got because that'll help me to tailor future videos and future articles so that I can address the models that you're particularly interested in and just really give you value from your subscription to this channel. So one of the easy mods that people talk about is the Sprint Booster. I won't say it adds an amount of power to the engine, but it does increase the throttle response. So it basically is an interface between the throttle pedal and the ECU. And it's a little bit like when I wake my wife up in the morning by shining a torch in her eyes and shouting train, it creates an overreaction. So this little sprint booster is creating that overreaction to your inputs on the throttle pedal, shouting at the ECU, implying that you're pressing it much harder. And that has the effect of ramping everything up. The fuel delivery is ramped up to accommodate for that, that more aggressive throttle usage. And the car does feel substantially livelier and more sporty. So the sprint booster has got a few different settings on it. So you can, you can vary the degree of aggressiveness on that throttle response and really tailor that to suit your own particular driving style. The nice thing about the Sprint Booster is that it can be easily removed. So you haven't got to worry about warranty work when your car goes back to the dealer. You just unplug the Sprint Booster and the car is back to being completely standard so they can run all the checks and diagnostics on it and return the car back to you. And you can plug the Sprint Booster back in and you've got that little bit of a performance uplift. So a lot of people talk about induction kits. So let's just think about induction kits on the CRDI engine. Now, it doesn't make a substantial amount of power. If you've done nothing else to your 
engine, you're wasting your money fitting an induction kit to these. The, the stock factory fuel filter and intake setup flows more than adequately for the stock engine. When you start to ramp the power up significantly, you will start to hit a restriction. And that's the point you need to think about the intake. So I would still recommend going with a performance panel filter. So this replaces the factory paper filter with a higher flowing one. They're typically made of some sort of cotton gauze material, and it flows much better than the factory one. And that'll often give you a little bit more freedom at the top end. The turbo will tend to spool up that little bit more quickly because there's not so much of a restriction in the system. So the performance panel filter is really what I would recommend. If you've got experience with the full induction kits on these, please let me know. Let me know the models that you fitted or the makes of the induction kit that you fitted and what your experience has been. I'd really love to hear about your projects and what you're actually doing to this great little engine. The main reason a lot of people fit these open cone induction kit filters is because of the lovely induction roar that they create. It really does make the engine sound much more sporty, much more throaty. But the downside of that is the engine can be hard to live with on long drives and long commutes. A lot of people that have had induction kits fitted eventually tire of the noise and the constant drone. So manufacturers have designed their intakes to really minimize the noise that's coming on the intake. So you obviously lose that design feature from the manufacturer, but you are increasing the engine's ability to breathe. So depending on your engine and the other mods you do, you may well be needing to remove a restriction. So a full induction kit is obviously the best way to go. Don't site it in the engine bay where there's all the warm air. Try and channel it off. Most engine bays, you can put some sort of box mechanism in there to just filter it and have a cold air feed feeding cold air from outside. Because just remember that cold air has more oxygen and the engine is really needing that oxygen in order to burn the fuel. If the engine is sucking in warm air, it's getting less oxygen and it's going to be down on power. So in terms of induction kits that people have spoken to me about on these um, 1.6 CRDI engines, you've got the KNN, the BMC air filters and the green cotton air filters. So they're all brands that I've heard a lot about on other models. I've not had so much specific feedback on this engine. So let me know what your experience has been with these. Have you noticed the power increase? Did it improve the engine intake roar that you get when you put your foot down on the throttle? Did it make the car feel faster? Did you enjoy your car more after you fitted it? They're all questions that I really love to hear your expressions and your experiences. So the key thing to do really on these engines is the ECU itself. So unlocking the tune inside the ECU is your route to making substantially more power gains. So a lot of people talk about the factory setting. They've dulled it back about 20%. So they've probably done this to protect the turbo, to increase the fuel economy and to meet emissions regulations. But also they've got to take into account the poor qualities of fuel in different countries because they just have one setting really for all the different countries and the, the varying exhaust emissions regulations in those different regions and the adverse weather conditions. So some temperatures are much, much cooler than in other areas. So they've created a very generic, very, very safe map. So just tightening that up a little bit can give you that decent extra bit of power. Most people say they get about 20 to 30% more power remapping these 1.6 CRDI engines, which is certainly a noticeable jump in power. And for the cost, it's probably the biggest power gain you can get to the amount of money that you outlay for that power gain. So I would certainly recommend looking into to remaps. There's various different options. Some people offer piggyback boxes that plug in between the ECU and the various sensors on the engine. So some of those are really crude in operation and I would avoid those like the plague, but others are much more complex. They've got microprocessors. They do a lot more thinking for the car, for the ECU. They respond more quickly than the ECU. So they generally don't overfuel they keep everything running cleanly and nicely within the engine so you're not clogging up your DPF filter or causing any other problems through the catalysts or other components within the exhaust system. You really can't beat though getting your car set up on a rolling road so that's why they put your car on a rolling road and they fine tune the ECU to the exact car that you've got, the engine you've got. So bear in mind that every engine as it comes out of the factory is slightly different the manufacturing tolerances are never quite as perfect as you might think they are nowadays. They're a lot better than they used to be, but I've seen substantial differences between engines. So maybe one was done on a Friday afternoon after everyone had been at the pub and the others had been done on maybe a Tuesday morning when everyone's awake and really, really focused on their work. So this all has a bearing really in the various manufacturing and quality control processes that go on in the factory. So 
getting your car set up will also take into account any other mods that you've done. So if you've done anything to the induction, the air intake, the exhaust as well, or you maybe change the DPF filter if it's legal to do that in your area or the catalyst, the rolling road tune will just enable you to set the car up precisely to fully release the power in all those different mods that you've done. So next up is looking at the turbo. So the turbo in these engines is compressing the air. It's doing a lot of work. So obviously, if you want to make more power, that is the biggest thing that you can change. But it's also one of the most expensive. So you won't get anywhere near the same return for your money that you would have got by getting the ECU specifically tuned or remapped. But turbo charger upgrades are certainly a decent consideration if you want to hit those higher power figures. So there's been a, a few different turbos used in these. So generally speaking, it's the Garrett 282012A400. That's the factory designation or something similar to that. So I'd be curious to know if there was a bigger turbo used on the two litre and whether that can easily be transplanted onto the 1.6 because in other makes and models, that's obviously the route to go. You stick with what the manufacturer has done, designed and set up and you just bolt the larger capacity turbo on. But in some cases that may spool up so slowly you've lost all the low end power. Although you're getting that nice big bump at the top end, it's not a great upgrade or an upgrade mod that you would want to consider. So a lot of people would go the aftermarket route. So you've got various hybrid turbos where they take the stock turbo, remachine it, remanufacture it, change the internals and give you a completely different spool and compression characteristic that help you to hit those higher power figures. I found it hard finding many turbos for the 1.6 CRDI engine. I did find a much boost hybrid turbo variant. I don't know a lot about it. I've not had very much feedback about it. Just really a suggestion from one of our members. So please let me know if you've got any experience with the much boost turbo upgrade for the Hyundai 1.6 CRDI engine. And if you have other options or you found alternatives, please let me know in the comments because I'd love to make a much more comprehensive video for this engine. So the hybrid turbo will certainly get you to about 200 horsepower. Going over 200 horsepower up to the 300 horsepower mark, you start to need to do a lot more work in the engine. So typically the injectors, the fuel system, the fuel pump itself, and also oil cooling becomes a consideration on these engines because everything is running much hotter and you really want to keep that oil within its operating parameters. Otherwise it will start to shear away and you'll be getting excessive wear on your 1.6 CRDI engine. But bear in mind that most of these cars that these engines are fitted to are front wheel drive. So you will start to get traction issues on most of them around about 220 horsepower. So often going beyond 220 horsepower, you're just going to experience a lot of wheel spin, wear your tires down, and you're not going to be able to fully exploit that power. So do think about that when you think about upgrading. A lot of people I've seen on various projects have wasted so much money hitting those headline high power power figures and in reality they've not been able to fully enjoy the car. It looks great on a dyno day or they can do quarter mile runs where they're using the top end of the RPM range and they're on a super sticky drag strip but on the road they've created a car that's almost impossible to drive enjoyably. So one other area that I would say to focus on on these engines is the intercooler. So the intercooler cools down the air charge. When you compress it through the turbo, it gains a lot of heat. The turbo itself is hot, but the act of compressing the air makes everything inside a lot hotter. So the intercooler will expose this heated air charge to the ambient air temperature. So it's still pressurized, but it's started to cool down and cooler air carries more oxygen. So that can help you to free up that little bit more power, but it doesn't really add power as such. It stops you losing power. So as the intercooler warms up, you get heat soak where the intercooler becomes less and less effective at cooling down that charge of air. So you're running with less oxygen, you're able to burn less fuel and you'll be slightly down on power. So if you do a lot of spirited driving, you may notice this heat soak starting to kick in where it becomes a problem. So if you're certainly starting to see that, look at various intercooler upgrades. Bigger is not always better. I've got other videos that go into more detail on intercoolers and the differences in power at the intake temperature as well, which was quite an interesting one to research. So often I get asked about sports exhausts. Now on diesel engines, I never feel a sports exhaust adds much. The diesel engine engine exhaust note is not fantastic. It's not as good as your average gasoline or petrol power. So in most cases, you want to muffle that. So the benefits you get from that noisier sports exhaust 
uh, often outweighed by the inconvenience of driving the car just because it's become very, very droney. But let me know what your experiences have been. The general idea is to increase the flow through the exhaust system to enable the engine to breathe better. The area that most people should focus on, if it's legal to do so in your area, is the catalysts and the DPFs, the diesel particulate filters. These tend to be the biggest drag, the biggest pain in the exhaust system. There are often sports alternatives that can be fitted legally in a lot of areas. And if that's the case, that certainly is your option to freeing up that lost power due to these devices. But manufacturers nowadays are designing them fairly efficiently. They want to meet those emissions regulations. They want to give you as much power as possible, which involves just making sure the engine can burn as effectively as possible and efficiently as possible. So they've not really designed in these restrictions, but they are obviously working to a budget, a price point. So some compromises are often made by manufacturers in these areas. So that's really an overview of what I found so far for the Hyundai 1.6 CRDI engine. Let me know in the comments what your thoughts are on this video. If you've got little tips to add, please do so. The people that watch these videos often view the comments and come back and view comments and replies. So it, it becomes a really nice resource. So please share your knowledge and I'll make a more detailed video on this engine when I've got more facts to work from. So I just really wanted to answer the questions that we were asked about this engine and really give you everything I know so far about these engines. So thanks for watching. Please boot that like button because that really does help us to get out there. If you've not subscribed, please do so. We've got lots of stuff coming up on this great engine and the Hyundai and the Kia models as well. We've got videos that we've got planned in production to cover each of those, helping you to get the most out of those and which mods work, which mods don't work. And I've lined this video up for you if you're interested in performance tuning and just want to know a little bit more about getting the most out of your diesel engine. So thanks for watching and I'll see you in this next video.